Classes in Statistical Mechanics. Lectures by Professor George Phillies, based on his book, Elementary Lectures in Statistical Mechanics, Springer Verlag, 2000. And today, this lecture is Lecture 15, A Search for Clever Expansions. I'm Professor Phillies, and we are now continuing our lecture on statistical mechanics of interacting particles. Today we're going to go to my book, Elementary Lectures in Statistical Mechanics, and we are going to advance to Chapter 16. And Chapter 16 is our introduction to cluster expansions. We won't actually do cluster expansions today because Chapter 16 discusses something else. It discusses, well, how would you have found this if you didn't know what the answer was in advance? So, the first issue was as follows. We have a system of particles in a fluid. They each, each particle has a kinetic energy. Each particle interacts via a potential energy with all of the n other particles in the system, n minus 1 actually. So there are n square minus n potential energy terms. Because the particles all interact with each other, and because nothing terribly nice is happening in terms of atomic ordering or whatever, the energy of the system is inseparable. That it, as far as we know, there is no system of coordinates we can choose in which we can write the energy and the energy um, can be split into a terms, e each of which depends on only a few coordinates and the rest of which does not depend on that, those coordinates at all. The opposite of that were separable systems. And so, for example, we had gas molecules in which, yes, if I have two gas atoms, they may vibrate, they may rotate around each other, they're at the same molecule, but I can reduce the description of a gas molecule to a center of mass position and a momentum and a couple of internal coordinates, and what the other molecules are doing doesn't matter. Ditto, in a crystal, every atom is connected to neighbors, though only near neighbors, that's critical. And therefore, we can go in, and because molecular vibrations in a crystal are small, we can linearize the system, and once we've linearized it, we can use um, the usual methods for saying, gee, we can divide this into a set of collective coordinates and the energy can be written as the sum of the energy stored by each collective coordinate separately. Well, here we don't get to do that. Instead, we push ahead and we write, let's say, we are going to write the simple partition function, the canonical ensemble partition function for the energy of the system. Well, the total energy has a kinetic energy part, and it has a position coordinate part, potential energy. The kinetic energy parts are all separable from each other and from the potential energy. And we can do all of the kinetic energy parts the same way we did for the ideal gas. And what is left is the potential energy. What, and this brings us to page... 234 in equation 16.1. In that equation, we've already done the integrations over all of the momenta using methods we've been using since O chapter 4 or so. Uh, we have included the quantum factor H cube, or really it's H to the 3n. We've taken account that the particles are indistinguishable, and so we now have a canonical ensemble partition function in which there are a remaining set of 3n integrals over e to the minus beta total potential energy of the system. Okay, so far so good. Well, if the number of atoms in the system were very small, you might be able to do the integrals analytically. If there are only two atoms in the system, Potential energy typically only depends on distance. So while there are, for two atoms there are six coordinates, only one of those six coordinates is doing anything, and you can do the integral. Ditto, 
if there were only three atoms, it turns out you can actually also, in general, do the integrals analytically. Uh, you have to be a little clever. Uh, however, if we look at the gas air in this room, there's slightly more than three air atoms in it. If there were only three, you couldn't hear me talking because you'd be breathing a vacuum. Uh, but you might say, maybe there's some way to do something clever. And we're now going to discuss how you cast about looking for a solution when you do not know what the solution is. Okay. So one thing you might say is, well, in a low-density gas, pairs of atoms are colliding. On rare occasions, you get collisions where three atoms come together and collide. And by the time you get up to four or five atoms, things are quite uncommon. And you might say that maybe only the small order, ter small order terms in which there are only a few collisions at a time matter. If you think about the room, though, this is probably not nearly as good as you would think. An atomic collision at l lasts 10 to the minus 14 or 10 to the minus 15 seconds, some number like that, depending on how you count the collision. There are 10 to the 23rd atoms in the room, so if even only one atom in a thousand is in a collision at a given time, do the math, and I have just told you there are 10 to the 5 collisions going on at any given moment in this room. Well, actually, the room holds more than a mole of gas. It's way more than 10 to the 5. It's lots of collisions at a time, so maybe that's not going to work. Okay. Um, however, you might then say, gee, is there anything else we can do? Well, one thing you can do is to fool around a bit with the coordinates. This won't help you a whole lot. And here's what we will do to fool around with the coordinates. At the moment, we're starting out with the blue coordinates. And there is an origin down here in the corner. And we have coordinates 1, 2, 3 of the three gas atoms. Yes? Mm -hmm. And what we say is, for all of the gas atoms except first, we will shift the origin to be the position of atom number one. So one coordinate is R1, the position of the first atom with respect to the origin. And then we will say there are coordinates like R13 and R12, which go from atom one up to atom three or over to atom two. R13 is R3 minus R1, and sometimes that sign looks a bit surprising at first, but watch. I'm going to start at 1 and go up to 3. So I first go this way along the R1 vector, that's a minus R1 step, and I then go this way along the R3 vector, that's a plus R3 step, and therefore the vector from 1 to 3 is indeed minus R1 plus R3. There's one other thing you want to be careful of. There are n atoms, yes? Each atom has one vector coordinate. And therefore, after we have done this, we started in this case with 1, 2, 3 coordinates, and we end up with 1, 2, 3 coordinates. There's also a vector coordinate R23 from R2 to R3. That's not an independent coordinate. It's determined by R12 and R13. And that's somewhat important for the following reason. If I write the potential of the three gas atoms, yes, um, the potential energy between 1 and 2 in our, for our simple potentials is determined by the distance magnitude of R1, 2. The potential energy between 1 and 3 is determined by the simple distance between R1 and R3. Yes? Now, the, uh, R, the distances R1, 2 and R1, 3 actually are single coordinates because they can just be the magnitude of these two vectors. However, the potential energy between R2 and R, 
particles 2 and 3 depends on the distance r to 3, the magnitude. But that's not a coordinate. Instead, to generate the distance r to 3, you have to say, I have this vector, I have this vector, I know the clever trig that is required to compute this length, but this length is written in terms of r1, 2, and r1, 3. And therefore, the potential energy v2, 3, while it is indeed v2, 3 of the distance r2, 3, v2, 3 is a function of r1, 2, and of r1, 3. And therefore, you cannot break the potential energy into pieces, one piece per coordinate, because this piece of the potential energy is determined by something that is not a single coordinate. Um, when we do this change of vectors, there is one nice thing that happens. Namely, <clears throat> if I take all of the atoms at the same time and displace them by the same amount in the same direction, after I've done that, they're all the same distance apart. Yes? Mm -hmm. That's what invariance is, yes? Well, that says that none of the energy depends on the vector r1, because I just changed r1. The energy does not change. And therefore, I can do the integral over dr1 all by its lonesome. Once I've gone into these coordinates, nothing in the integrand depends on r1 by itself. And therefore, the integral dr1 just gives me a volume v. And I am now left with the integral over n minus 1 instead of n vector coordinates, because I was able to separate out r1 and integrate it. Well, that's true, but you only get one of these per system. And since the system contains rather more than, say, two particles, this is only a small help. Some people will point out that, well, if I take the system and rotate it, take the whole system and rotate it, all of the directions of all of the vectors change, all of the relative angles do not change, and therefore somehow there are two more coordinates I could integrate out corresponding to the system doesn't care that the energy does not change as I do this. So there are two orientation, system orientation angles that I could also integrate out. And you can do this, but the resulting coordinate system is rather messy and doesn't help. Nonetheless, in the end, we have gone from 3n to it's actually 3n minus 5 coordinates. Well, that's going to help. That isn't going to do a great deal. So the question is, what do we do next? Um, <clears throat> one thing we could do, and we will calculate the pressure in a piece, is to show that we can write the pressure of the gas in the form of equation 16.3. Equation 16.3 is what is known as a virial expansion. Uh, did either of you encounter virials in classical mechanics? or something called the Virial Theorem in classical mechanics. It relates the potential and the kinetic energy, and it is this is in fact the same Virial, but you have to be quite clever to see they're the same. I think we touched on it in quantum one. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, touching on if you touched on it in quantum one, the shadow of it has passed across your brow, but the truth of the matter is you have to be quite sharp indeed to show it's the same virial. It really is. However, what the virial theorem says is that the pressure of an ideal gas is kT times a power series in the density. And that's for a non-ideal gas. Um, and you can write, uh, we can write the pressure in this form. The coefficients bj, the expansion coefficients, depend on temperature, but they don't depend on density. If they depended on the density, this would be a really losing um, 
a density expansion because it would be a density expansion in which the coefficients were density dependent. There's, you wouldn't know anything new. Uh, the um, coefficients B also don't depend on the pressure. You've extracted the pressure to the far side. The coefficients B do, however, in general, depend on the temperature. And if you say there's a density expansion, you might think, well, gee, what else depends on the density other than the pressure? And one thing that depends on the density is the number of interacting pairs, triplets, quadruplets of molecules. There are a certain number of molecules that are close together and interact, and there are lots that don't. Um, the coefficients B can be made to look sort of like the um, contributions of interacting triplets, quadruplets, but that's not exact. And that is a general feature of expansions based on, this is actually the grand canonical ensemble, uh, namely the Bs look sort of like groups of interacting particles, but that's not precise. You might ask, can I do a new expansion in which the series depends on the actual number of interacting pairs, triples, etc. Um, I am not aware of anyone who has actually done this, and in general that sort of cluster expansion leads to interesting difficulties. Okay, uh, why do we know the bees don't correspond to simply interacting particles? Well, um, if you have purely repulsive interactions like hard spheres, uh, the things that are going into the Bs are, are look like X minus beta V. For hard spheres, X V is zero or infinity. X minus beta V is one or zero, yes. And if you combine a lot of ones and zeros and simply add them up, you might think, gee, does that tell us that all of the capital B's are positive? No. All of the capital B's are not positive. If you do this for a hard sphere gas, it's quite clear that some of the B's, for N not very large at all, like a dozen or sixteen, some of the capital B's are negative. And so they don't correspond in a simple way to interacting groups of particles. Nonetheless, it's an inspiring idea and leads us to the next math step. Let us consider the integral in 16.1. And suppose we just had three particles. The most of the potential energies we talked about, other than the hard sphere, are non-zero out to infinity. Okay. And that means that e to the minus beta v is a number that is not 1, e to the 0, all the way from 0 out to infinity. So when we do the integrals in equation 16.1, take a gander at equation 16.1, we're interact integrating over the relative positions of all of those particles, yes? Well, over most of the dist values of R1, 3, v is very close to zero indeed, and therefore e to the minus beta v is very close to one. And so when we do those integrals, we integrate over the relative position of these two gas atoms right here, and we integrate from actually in contact out to the boundaries of the room. And there are contributions to that integral, significant contributions, which you actually have to compute all the way out. Well, that's sort of annoying because you actually have, if you want to do this integral numerically, you'd have to do the integral over huge volumes of space. And the question is, is there a way of doing this better? Well, one answer is to look at e to the minus beta v for one molecule, or one pair. And we will add to e to the minus beta v the number 0. Now, the no number 0 here is going to be represented in a relatively simple-minded form. We could be less simple-minded. And the relatively simple-minded form is 
minus 1 plus 1. And so we replace e to the minus beta v with e to the minus beta v minus 1 plus 1. Now why is that useful? Well, e to the minus beta v minus 1, the atoms are this far apart, e to the minus beta v minus 1 is real close to 0. In order for e to the minus beta v minus 1 to be significant, v has to be significantly different from 0, and it actually has to be fairly significantly different from 0 because you're exponentiating it. And e to the um, 0, or e to the, say, 10 to the minus 9, is real close to 1 indeed. So you, so long as you do this, you realize that e to the minus beta v minus 1 is only non-zero over teeny tiny distances. And over the rest of space, e to the minus beta v minus 1 is very close to 0 indeed. So the first thing we do is we introduce a symbol seen in 16.4 for e to the minus beta v minus 1. We call it Fij. F is so important it has a name. F is the Meyer F function. And then e to the minus beta v is Fij plus 1. This is purely notation so far. So far so good? Mm -hmm. OK, well, let's rewrite the partition function in terms of the Meyer F function, and that's done in 16.6. .6. And when we do that, I've said the exponential of the sum is equal to what? The product of the exponentials. And therefore, e the e to the minus sum becomes product all of these terms. Now I've introduced a slightly funny product symbol there. What is the point on the product symbol? Well, the product goes over all i and it goes over all j. So i and j both go from 1 to capital N. So far so good. However, i and j are never equal because that would correspond to a particle interacting with itself, which does not happen, except in quantum mechanics. So i is never equal to j, and so we have the double product. Okay, and a 16.7 simply shows you what the product notation looks like. There are n square minus n terms in that product. Most of them depend on the coordinates of, on two coordinates, r12, r13, or whatever. Okay, what could we do to expand this? Well, one reaction is to say, okay, I have this big product. Let's break out the binomial theorem. The binomial theorem was good enough for Sherlock Holmes' chief opponent, Professor Moriarty, who did research in it. It was a big topic at the time. So it'll be good enough for us, too. And there, in equation 16.8, is what happens when we break out the binomial theorem. And there's one term which gets nothing but a product of all of the ones. And then there are a whole pile of terms which are all 1's except for 1f. And then there's a second term which is all 1's except we get 2 of the f's. Now you have to be a little careful when you write down the, pro the sum over all products of 2f's. And there is now a new funny notation, open paren ij, close paren, open paren mn, close paren. That's in equation 16.8. See equation 16.8? Look at the last term on this first line. Why is that funny notation there? Well, that funny notation is there because each term, say f12, appears only once in the big product. Particles interact with each other only once, not twice. And therefore, in the term Fij, Fmn, 
each of the Fij and Fmn go through all of the combinations, but you never see a cross product with the same term twice. So the product Fij, Fmn does not include a term F12, F12, because that's not in the original. Ditto, the product of three Fs has the same property, except none of the three Fs have to be the same. Is this a big deal? Well, there are n to the four, approximately, terms F12, F34. Yes? There are n square terms in F12, F12. So, Imposing this limit, if we have a huge system, has almost no effect because there are almost no terms that would appear counted twice. There are n to the four terms where if you didn't impose this restriction, the F12 and the F34, the Fij and the Fmn are different. There are only n square terms where you mistakenly insert an extra term and n square is really small with respect to n4 if n is Avogadro's number. Okay? All right. However, maybe this isn't quite as satisfactorily as, as you would like yet. Why not? Well, the sum ij, fij, the first term in that, in a sense describes a system in which the whole room <coughs> in the whole room, there are only one pair of atoms that are colliding. There are really a whole lot more than one pair of colliding atoms. And therefore, if you wanted to carry this series out until you got more or less all of the collisions you were going to have, and not more, um, you would need like I think we did the number 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 8 Fs multiplied together. That's a lot. This isn't a big help. So what else can we do? Okay, well one thing you can do is cast about. If you cast about, you maybe come up with an approximant. And equation 16.9 is an approximant. In equation 16.9, um, what we've done is to say we're going to exponentiate the integration. Well, you've never seen that as a math step because it's not a direct math step. It's a guess and it's an approximation which gives you kind of the same answer but not quite. Yes? So why is 16.9, in which we have an e to the integral of fij, and then we integrate over the fij's one at a time, why is that an approximant for the previous equation? Hmm, why is it an approximant? Well, let's do one thing we can do if we see an exponential. We can do a Taylor series expansion of the exponential. The variable being um, Taylor series expanded is um, summation i naught equal j to n integral drij fij over v. We are Taylor series expanding this sum we are taking as the Taylor series expansion variable this sum over n squared minus n terms. So it's a rather complicated variable we're expanding. Note, by the way, there is no minus beta in there. We are not, that is, we are not manipulating the potential energy. We are putting this thing into the exponential. And what happens when we expand that Taylor series? Well, what happens is there are the things out in front, including the factor v to the n, and they sit there. Mm -hmm. The first term in the Taylor series expansion is the number 1. Mm -hmm. And if you compare with the previous page, that's exactly correct. The second sum in the Taylor series is summation i naught equal to j fij. 
And that's correct, too. Now you might ask, gee, is it really correct? Yes, that's really correct. The reason it's really correct is that we rigged the thing to be correct. We really did. You have to you might worry a bit if I put in the capital V's exactly the right way. And you can check whether the V's need to be adjusted a bit. And so the second term is correct. Well, it's correct, too, because I rigged it that way. In the third term, we have a one-half, and there are two Fi, there's an Fij and an Fmn. Now, there's also a one-half, but if you check the math carefully, there's also a one-half, because this, the uh, product there, generates, for example, F1, 2, F3, 4, twice. It generates it once when it's F1, 2, F3, 4, and once when it's F3, 4, F1, mm -hmm. 2, and the previous one only generates it once, so the half is not a big deal. The next pro issue is you notice that since the sums on IJ and MN in the third term of 1610, the two sums are independent of each other, what th bad thing happens? What bad thing happens? You get I, I, J is equal to M, M. They're independent. Do you see that? Yeah. I, J can equal M, N? Yes, you saw that. That's sometimes hard to see, but you saw that. Good. Well, G, the IJ equal the um, IJ equal MN terms do not exist in the original. They exist here. Mm -hmm. However, as I pointed out before, there are n to the four terms where IJ does not equal MN. There are n square terms where IJ does equal MN. So that is an error, but it is only an error of one over Avogadro's number squared. That's true. Now, of course, if your system only contains eight atoms, that might be significant. But if you're doing the atoms in this room, um, it's very significant unless we have a really good vacuum in here. Okay, what about the third terms? The th next term, the 1 over 3 cubed, and now there's a product of 3Fs. Mm -hmm. Well, the 1 over 3 cubed is just the fact you generate each term three factorial term times rather than once. The one over three factorial does not matter. Mm -hmm. There will also be a G, you could generate duplicate terms, but those duplicate terms are still down by one over Avogadro's number square, or for the really bad one, F12, 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 they're down by Avogadro's number cubed. Unfortunately, the third term has another problem. I'll let you look at this one. This one is a little more subtle, but I will let you look at it. You can have two of those ends equal, but not equal to the third. Mm, that's true, and that gives you an error of order 1 over n, n squared. Square. That is, if, if you get generate an f12, f12, f34, that term does not exist. But they're only capital N squared of them instead of capital N to the 4. Or maybe I should say they're capital N square of them rather than capital N to the 6. There aren't a whole lot of those. There's another problem. Okay, let me point out the other problem. Look at the last term of equation 16.10. Mm -hmm. And I will actually put in numbers. So there is an integral dr12 over f12. There is an integral dr13, that's an independent coordinate, over f13. And then there is an integral dr23 over f23. Which is not an independent coordinate. Yes. Well, in the original calculation, 
R13 and R12 are coordinates, and R23 is not an independent coordinate. In the approximant, R23 has become independent of R12 and R13, which is fine if particles 2 and 3 can be in several places at the same time, but it's really bad otherwise. So therefore, we have a problem. And the question is, how do we fix the problem? Well, one answer is to say, well, maybe we need a better approximant. And if you're clever, what you say is, you know what the error is. It's the error is the difference between the term you actually get in equation 16.10 the term which shows up on page 237 as this object, which is the three separate integrals, and the term you should get in which f12, f23, f13 are integrated over only two independent variables. So one thing you could say is, well, let's go into this original approximant and let's put a, in a term that subtracts out the mistake. Yes? Mm -hmm. And the term that subtracts out the mistake is approximately the correct answer, that is something that goes F12, F23, F31. The correct term, which where you have three Fs but only two variables, minus the wrong term the three integrals being taken separately. That's the size of the error. So you say, we will take something that is the error, and we will subtract it out of the exponential, and we will see if we get any place. And if you subtract it out of the exponential, um, well, if you go to page 238, fourth line, I actually write down what the correction looks like. And you can imagine subtracting it out, and gee, you'll get something that's more accurate. Hmm. And we could clearly do this for four terms, five terms, six terms. And if you think about it a bit, you sort of see when there is going to be an error. And the error is going to arise, suppose I had not up here three atoms, but tons of atoms. The error arises if you have a term if the f's run in a circle. Because if the f's run in a circle, one of those coordinates linking up all of the f's is not independent from all of the rest of them. Yes, and at that point, this exponentiation thing is going to generate a term that claims it is, and you have to subtract that term out. Well, gee, can we cleverly manage to um, fix that? And the answer, I suppose, is in principle you could, but it gets very messy. And the, instead, we use one of two alternative paths to get to the answer. And one of the paths is based on manipulating the grand canonical ensemble formulas and inverting some series. And the other path is, involves something in mathematics known as partitions. Okay, what is a partition? A partition says, I have some number of colored marbles. They're all different. Start. I am going to put the colored marbles, they're small marbles, into egg crates. And the egg crates have, or I'm going to take colored beans, and I'm going to put them into receptacles on a Moncala board. Yes? Mm -hmm. Well, there are how many different ways are there of putting the colored beans into the holes or the colored marbles into the spaces on the egg crate? Well, if I want to keep the same number of beans in each place, you have to be more careful than that. But there is, it's a general partition. How many ways are there of doing this? And you can use partitions to get to this answer. The approach using by partitions was done by Friedman. It's done in his book, Ionic Solution Theory, which is a little hard to get. 
but I have a copy, and it's done in his stat MacBook. Your alternative and the your alternative is to use the manipulate the power series. They get you to kind of the same place at kind of the same time. We'll use the manipulate the power series. This is also done in Macquarie's book on statistical mechanics. Uh, I, I sort of hinted Macquarie's statistical mechanics, if you can find a copy, is that one of these things that is definitely worth owning for this sort of problem. Okay, so let's look at the first step, which shows the grand canonical ensemble. And we have kind of done this before, but we're going to do it again. And the general notion is we are going to try to do the grand canonical ensemble for the partition function of an ideal gas. Well, the general partition function is a z to the n summation over all states of the system, and there's a 1 over n factorial and an h to the 3n, and then you sum n from 0 to infinity. Because the grand canonical ensemble corresponds to there's no atoms in the room, there's one atom, there's two atoms, there's a whole pile of atoms, and we sum up all of the probabilities which include that factor z, the fugacity. Well, in order to write out the partition, grand canonical partition function for all the atoms in this room, you note that each term of the grand canonical ensemble depends on q, the regular partition function. So if you're smart, you realize you will replace Q with what it actually is for an ideal gas. And that's equation 16.12. And if you look at 16.12, there is the canonical ensemble partition function for capital N atoms of an ideal gas. And having said that's what Q is, you plug Q in to the um, grand canonical ensemble expression, and you get psi which I have written out as equation 16.13. Reminder, in the grand canonical ensemble, the number of atoms, which is little n here, goes from 0 up to infinity. You may have to worry about the convergence problem, and the answer is that for normal potentials and normal convergence, what happens is if n is large enough, you can't fit the atoms into the room because they're close packed already, and the statistical weight of those really big n terms goes to zero. Um, that has problems if the system is a plasma, and solving that was only done after I was a grad student. Um, that's after the introduction of Arabic numerals, by the way. It really is. I was a grad student after we introduced Arabic numerals. Not by as much as I'd like, but it was. Um, having said that, um, for plasmas, and especially if you insert gravity, life gets much more complicated. And in fact, um, there is a largest solid object that you remember to include plasma, so it's modestly larger than the planet Jupiter. Uh, if you try to do anything much bigger than that, um, what happens is uh, the hydrogen or whatever in the middle of the planet ionizes, the system compresses, and you put in more and more mass, and eventually, if you put in all of the atomic nuclear theory right, you get an object that is full of neutronium. And the neutronium is stable because it's fermions, it's fermi solid, and that remains true. And the fir if you put in more material, the neutronium gives you a bigger and bigger sphere, a neutron star, go well, bigger and bigger, but quite modestly small. And this continues until you get a black hole. Well, in any event, we won't worry about that. We have equation 16.13. But if you look hard at 16.13, you realize it is something to the power little n times 1 over n factorial. And the summation a to the n over n factorial is a function. It's an exponential 
and the exponential is 16.14. So there is the grand canonical partition function. 16.14 is e to the something z. And that sounds sort of like e to the um, f symbol, doesn't it? Especially since z is multiplying the partition function for one atom. This looks a great deal like the approximant we guessed at except I've done the integrals. Well, psi is e to the beta pv also, and therefore beta pv is equal to log psi is log of that exponential, giving me equation 16.15 for the pressure. And there is an exact expression for the pressure in terms of the fugacity, which is one of the control parameters. And if we wanted, I have just told you that I can replace the fugacity z with the pressure in the room. Uh, on the other hand, n average is z dz log psi. And in order to do that, you take d dz log psi and you plug equation 16.13 or the general form into it. And if you're careful and do the math, you get something that is obviously an average in the grand canonical ensemble. And in fact, you also get, if you take z dz log psi, that is z dz, d, dz of 16.14, you get equation 16.17. You really do. OK. Well, 16.17 looks exactly like the right side of equation 16.15. And therefore, you get beta PV equals an average equation 16.18. And we have just derived the ideal gas equation and if you trace through my book, we have just arrived it for the fourth time. Okay? Well, having said this, we are done with this chapter. There is a homework, try 16.3, yes, and try which is sort of the same problem, 16.5. And consider what you would have to do to the Fij if there were, was also a three-body potential. If there's a three-body potential, this is essentially equation f or problem four, but just get as far as saying there's a three-body potential, so there are terms in the potential energy that cannot be written as two particle terms. They can only be written as three particle terms. And think about that and see what you get.